Welcome to School Scene. I'm Dan Bridges, Superintendent of Naperville Community Unit School District 203. And I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Karen Sullivan, Superintendent of Indian Prairie School District 204. Together, Karen and I are responsible for the education of 46,000 students in 55 schools across Naperville in areas of Aurora, Bolingbrook, Lyle, Plainfield, and Woodridge. Our mutual goal is to ensure each student receives a first-class education and leaves our districts well prepared for their next phase of life, whatever that may be. With the world of education constantly evolving for the next half hour, we want to share with you, our community, how students in districts 203, 204, and Wheaton Warrenville Community Unit School District 200 are preparing for their academic futures beyond the four walls of the classroom through the Expanding Learning Opportunities Consortium, or ELO. To kick things off, Karen and I are joined by Dr. Jeff Schuler, Superintendent, Wheaton Warrenville District 200, and Kip Pigman, Director of the Expanding Learning Opportunities Consortium. Welcome. Kip, why don't you begin by telling our audience a little bit about what is the Extended Learning Opportunities Consortium, or what we call ELO. Sure. Well, first, thank you so much for hosting us this morning. ELO is thrilled to be here and share more about the ELO program uh, with your audience. Um, the, the vision and leadership of Districts 204, 203, and 200 is, is exceptional. Um, uh, they have broken down the silos that commonly exist in education across the country by partnering and working alongside one another to expand learning options for more students. And speaking of those options, beginning this fall, um, ELA will have 14 virtual course offerings available for students. Uh, some of these courses will be electives, some of the courses will be core based, such as math, science, social studies, and English. Um, and we'll have courses available from 9th, 10th, and 11th and 12th graders. And so we're we're very excited about the diversity of courses uh, available. So if you can for our audience, just a quick follow-up. What is a virtual course? Certainly. So um, the ELO courses exist 100% virtually. Um, and what that means is when students access their courses, um, they, they can access it from wherever, whenever they like. Um, they don't need to report to a local school building and a specific designated time period in order to work on their course. Great. Jeff, can you talk a little bit about why it's important to offer online experiences to our students? Absolutely. I think uh, actually in the, uh, the intro, uh, Mr. Bridges highlighted that our districts, I think, uh, collectively focus heavily on what it is that we're preparing students for. After they leave the, the walls of high school, the, the college world, the work world that they're entering into, uh, I think it's absolutely essential that kids have an experience with online learning because I think they're going to encounter it either at the college level, at the post-secondary work training level, and I think anything that we can do while they're in high school to give them that opportunity, give them that experience, only furthers the, the training that they have and the preparation they have to be successful when they leave us. Online courses have been around for a while in various venues, but what makes ELO different? That's an important question. When many students choose to enroll in an online course, the courses they take are often delivered by organizations outside their home school. Consequently, the home school has minimal control over the quality of instruction and who's delivering that instruction. And so what makes ELO so unique and special is that our instruction is delivered by our own passionate and innovative teachers from within the consortium. So you can be a student, for example, from District 200 and you might enroll in a course that's being taught by a teacher from District 204 or District 203. And by using our own teachers, they can ensure that the quality of instruction in our online courses is just as rigorous as the face-to-face -face courses. And so truly, the teachers from Districts 204, 203, and 200 are the heart of the consortium. Jeff, you mentioned this a little bit, but talk a little bit more about what trends you see forming in the field of education, especially related to online learning. Sure. I really see uh, three things uh, in terms of trends that I think kind of relate to online learning, especially the, the ELO consortium. And I think the first is just the concept of personalized learning. I think um, we are moving so much of education to be as personalized as possible, personalized in terms of time and place. So when kids learn, where they learn, really a 
expanding the boundaries of where learning uh, takes place. And, and so I think certainly um, online learning is one way that we enter into that, that frontier. Second thing that I, I really think is a trend in education is just moving toward blended learning opportunities. So uh, in ELO, we're really talking about a fully online uh, opportunity, but I think there is a whole spectrum from fully online learning to the traditional learning that takes place in classrooms. And I think more and more, um, we're looking for blended opportunities to ensure that kids, uh, kids do both. And then I think the third thing, uh, really I think of in terms of a trend, is just the whole concept of collaboration. So so um, the, the online learning experience, ELO, really creates opportunities for kids to collaborate both with, uh, with their teachers, with other instructors, with each other while they're learning. But I think it's also, I think, a tremendous opportunity for us uh, as, a, as a group of three districts to collaborate on how it is that we are going about delivering uh, a service in education, how we're being more efficient in the resources that we're utilizing, and candidly, how we're being efficient in terms of sharing the human resource uh, that we have, and, and I think we need to continue to look in that direction to, to really be, uh, be effective at what we do. Dr. Schuler talks a lot in his uh, words about um, the importance of ELO, it, how it relates to the trends in education moving forward. Now, we're only halfway through our, our first year, uh, but I'm sure you've had a lot of feedback from both students in the courses and the teachers teaching the courses as well as parents. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a little bit about what you're hearing. Certainly. The feedback we've gathered so far from both students and uh, teachers has been extremely positive. Um, speaking specifically to the student feedback, um, they appreciate the flexibility that an online course provides. And what I mean by that is um, they've enjoyed having a bit more control over where they access their online course, whether it's at the local um, public library, whether it's at school, or whether it's at home. They've appreciated having more control over when they access their online course, whether it's in the morning, in the afternoon, evening, late evening during the school week, on the weekends, or all of the above. Um, they've appreciated having a little more autonomy in their online courses, um, being able to go back and spend more time on concepts that they struggle with. But on the reverse side, um, on those concepts that they fully grasp, being able to move through at a, a more rapid pace. Um, in addition, many of the students have expressed that they were pleasantly surprised by the high levels of communication they had between their instructor and their peers in the online course. Uh, overall, 87% of the students from the fall classes stated that they would be interested to enroll in future ELO courses. And so that's very positive for, for us to hear. Um, as far as staff is concerned, um, all of our current ELO teachers have mentioned that they would um, enjoy to, to remain part of the program moving forward and continue teaching ELO courses. Um, but what's been most gratifying for me to hear is that many of the teachers have expressed that the ELO experience has helped them in their face-to-face -face classes because they've been able to pull a lot of the online tools they use in the online ELO courses and apply them in their face-to-face -face courses. But they've also been able to use a lot of the content and curriculum in their face-to-face -face courses and apply that to their online courses. And so that's been very positive for us to hear as well. That's great feedback. How about parent feedback? You mentioned you know, teachers and students. How about parent feedback? Certainly. Um, you know, the parent feedback directly relates to what we're hearing from the students and, and what Dr. Schuler referenced um, before related to personalization, um, where their child may have enrolled um, because uh, of conflicts outside of the school day and having the autonomy to work on their online course to um, balance um, all of their outside obligations worked best for their child. Or maybe their child worked better independently and more at their own pace. And so all the feedback we're hearing from parents uh, centers around that level of personal personalization. One little anecdote that I'll, I'll just add to that, our Board of Education recently was meeting with a group of students at one of our high schools, part of just a chat with the, the board session, and one of the students offered um, kind of, a, of an anecdote about a friend that was taking the same class, friend was taking it through ELO, they were taking it through the traditional learning experience at the high school, and uh, really the feedback that they heard from the student was it was a really effective learning model, and I think we, we highlight a lot of the, the reasons why on, online learning can kind of expand opportunities, but sometimes the question is, is the learning as effective? And certainly from what this student shared with our board, it absolutely was. That's great feedback. It seems like that idea of personalization is an important component of what ELO is bringing forward. Exactly. It, it, that personalization is, is probably one of the strongest benefits of offering these students online courses. And you know, we recognize that um, online courses aren't best for all students, but they're definitely best for some. Great. Thanks, Kip and Jeff, for joining us today. Um, when we return, Dan and I will talk to two teachers who will give us a first-hand account of how teaching online compares to a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. 
Stay tuned for more School Scene. Interested in getting a leg up on preparing for your post high school future? How about taking an online course? Most colleges and workplaces now require some form of online education. Talk to your counselor today about signing up for the Expanding Learning Opportunities Consortium or ELO. ELO students can take one of their eight courses entirely online, choosing from a mix of electives and core courses, all taught by District 200, 203, and 204 teachers. See what courses are available for both summer 2015 and the 2015-2016 school year by visiting eloconsortium.org. Welcome back to School Scene. Joining us now are Beth Knuth, web design teacher in District 204, and John Nofke, American government teacher in District 203. Uh, Beth, you want to talk a little bit about some differences between the rigor and the content in an online learning experience versus a traditional face-to-face -face classroom? Sure, I think the main difference really is that in an online course, it's more student-centered and it's really up to the individual student to go and check in with the course each day and, and check the daily announcements, participate in the discussion boards. We're in a traditional face-to-face -face class. You have a teacher there constantly every day reminding you um, of your assignments and your work. So um, it's really important to kind of advocate for yourself as a student in an online course. So even though the idea of online teaching sounds so different, Talk to us about the similarities. What's similar to you when you teach your bricks and mortar class or your regular classes with when you're teaching your ELO courses? Hmm. Similar um, would be that the, the overall content is the same. What I ask the students to do in an online class and a face-to-face -face class is the same activity. It's just that flexibility um, component to it. For example, that we tell our ELO students that you have uh, about five hours minimum of work to do in a seven-week span for most of our, most of our courses. That gives the student the choice of when you log on and developing your routine. So the, the, they're often mirroring what we're doing. They're just choosing a different time and a different location to dive into the content and the curriculum. Beth, what are some of the similarities you notice? You know, there's a lot of similarities. You can still have group work with other students, and you do uh, group projects, but it's just in a different format. So you do it through the discussion boards or through virtual chats and those types of things. Um, I still have a weekly agenda, due dates, calendars, things that students would see in a traditional face-to-face -face course as they would in an online. How about the differences? Any major differences? I would, yeah, I would, I would say the, the biggest difference is that uh, um, ability of, of a student organization. Instead of the teacher kind of leading when the work is done and setting that this day is when this is due, the student often has uh, more flexibility. So again, in, in some of my, uh, some of my students, in my last semester course, actually had all of their work done in the first two or three days of the week. So that, un unlike traditional class, you might have to wait till the end of the week to take the check-in quiz. They took it faster because that was their personal learning um, uh, timeline. Yeah, and again, since you don't meet every day at the same time, you have to really, as a student, set aside a time each day to go and um, dedicate to the course. Great. Beth, you've had the experience of teaching online for a while, but how have your perceptions changed since you first started teaching online? You know, when I first started, I was worried I wouldn't get to know the students as well, and because um, that's one of my favorite parts of the job, and I've found that I can get to know the students as well, if not better, in an online course. Um, I contact them almost on a daily, if not every other day basis, um, through emails, announcements. Again, I'm on the discussion boards quite a bit, and I really get to know them and their personalities through a variety of means. It's, it's really great. How about you, John? What, uh, how have you felt about uh, that idea of building those relationships? I, I would say for me, it's a lot. Um, I would do I do things like a picture of the week, where I'll post a picture every um, uh, every beginning of our cycle, which I do in my face to face as well. And the students have a choice of dis, um, guessing where I'm at in the world on a discussion board. And then I'll record myself the following week, kind of explaining where I am and kind of giving them a little bit of my adventure. So I use that connection as well as. Again, the being as available as I can possibly be online. So if they have a question, they'll know I'm going to be back with them within a day or so so that they're not um, feeling like they're on their own uh, in, uh, in the online world. 
So let's talk more about that idea of relationships. Great teachers build strong relationships with their kids. Some may have the perception that because it's being taught in an online environment, that's a little bit more difficult. Tell us how you're able to build positive relationships with your kids, with your students, and maybe even their parents or through that online environment. I think um, the main thing is I, again, try to be accessible. Like John had said, um, I'm constantly on the discussion boards and I try to um, communicate with the students quite a bit. Um, I also do an a icebreaker activity before school or before the class begins so the students can start to get to know each other a little bit more. They actually create a website about themselves with their favorite movie or their favorite hobbies, interests. And then they have to find two other students on the discussion board they have something similar with and comment on their website and talk about how um, they have some things in common. And I would say too, like we encourage the students to put, post a picture of themselves in Canvas so that every time they post on a board or send us a message, their picture comes up. So we have a chance and we have our pictures up as well so they can have that little human interaction um, so that, they, um, that they're just not a name but actual a face to all of us in our course. It's a real person behind the instruction yes. that's yes. happening. That's mm -hmm. great. Talk a little bit about how you might motivate students in an online environment. You know, you talked about how students have to self-pace themselves and really manage themselves. What do you do to try to motivate some of those skills? Um, one thing I like to do is definitely send out a lot of positive feedback to students. Um, I really try to give a lot of feedback on all the assignments and discussions and the comments. Um, and I, again, um, send a lot of positive emails to students when they're doing well instead of just always contacting the students that are maybe missing something or behind. Mm -hmm. I would say too, is your, is your word choice. A lot of times if you have to communicate to a student that they are behind or something needs to be improved, using, the, uh, using a like positive reinforcement or making sure that you're, you've, you've used a tone that kind of is not necessarily reprimanding but more encouraging. Often I'll say, oh, I've noticed I haven't seen you in about a week or so online. I haven't seen you log in. How, how's it going? What's going on? That kind of approach really lets the student know that you're not here to criticize them but more to check in and see, hey, I'm concerned because I've, I've noticed that you haven't been around as much in the online classroom, and I'd love to help you if you need some support when catching up. So we're halfway through that first year of ELO, and we've heard that the teachers that are currently teaching ELO courses have great interest in it, have enjoyed the experience. What is it about that experience, and what would you say to another teacher in your districts, in any of the three districts, that are thinking about wanting to be involved in teaching an ELO course, about what it would take to be a successful teacher? You know, I think what I really like about it is that you really see students grow. Um, they become more independent, they become more prepared for future, whether it's a future career or future educational experience, um, because they really have to advocate for themselves and set their own schedule and those types of things. So I think that's the best part about it, is just students, you see the student growth, an immense part of it. And I would add too is the, the resources, the amount of resources I found um, working on the curriculum have really benefited both my own teaching and my face-to-face -face and um, my department as some of the skills I have with using Canvas, our LMS system, have been, I've been able to share out with other uh, faculty members. And some of the, the videos I use for ELO, I use in my face-to-face -face as a way for students to um, reteach re themselves lessons. If they missed for a field trip or they just didn't quite get today's learning target, they know that on Canvas, in my face-to-face, -face, I've posted a video that they can watch as well. So that's been very beneficial for me to help continue to build what the uh, blended learning looks like uh, in my face-to-face -face courses as well. I would definitely recommend it to any teacher that wanted to give it a try. It's a neat experience. Real quick for both of you, for students who are thinking about enrolling in an ELO course, what's the one thing you would tell them that they need to, to know or be able to do to be successful in taking an ELO course? Organization, just you know, having a calendar, writing down due dates, because you don't see that teacher face-to-face -face every day, um, you know, you have to really organize yourself and make sure that you take part in the class. I would agree wholeheartedly and add uh, so, um, self-directedness. So making sure that if you have an issue that you reach out right away and that you don't wait, um, or as we like to call lurk online, where you're in and out but not actually fully engaged. So uh, that would be the other thing too, yes. So to kind of circle back to the very beginning, it sounds like advocacy and the idea of self-direction mm -hmm. are two of the big keys, probably both for the adults that are teaching the course as well as the kids that are enrolled in the courses. Absolutely. Yes. Well, it sounds like you're both teaching phenomenal courses, and I wish I could enroll in one of them. Thank you so <laughs> much for all that you've had to offer us today. Thank you, Beth and John, for joining us. And up next, we'll talk with Katie, a student in ELO, and her mom, Laura. Interested in getting a leg up on preparing for your post-high school future? How about taking an online course? 
Most colleges and workplaces now require some form of online education. Talk to your counselor today about signing up for the Expanding Learning Opportunities Consortium or ELO. ELO students can take one of their eight courses entirely online, choosing from a mix of electives and core courses, all taught by District 200, 203, and 204 teachers. See what courses are available for both summer 2015 and the 2015-2016 school year by visiting eloconsortium.org. Welcome back to School Scene. We're now joined by ELO student Katie Nyland and her mom, Laura. Katie, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about who you are as a student. What are your strengths? What do you like to do? How do you like to learn? Um, well, first, thank you for having me here today. Um, okay, so I'm a student at Nico Valley High School. I'm a freshman. Um, I'm a visual learner, and um, I'm like self-motivated to learn, but I also need to have like a good, engaging teacher and like an engaging classroom in order to um, like care about my class. Sounds very typical. It has to be meaningful to you and has to be important to you, right? Great. Tell me a little bit more about a visual learner. What does that mean? Um, I just sort of learn by like um, seeing and I also learn by hearing too sometimes, but I'm more on the visual side. Katie, what ELO class did you take and how does it compare to a traditional class? Um, I took geometry and um, at first, I thought that I wouldn't like get to know my like the um, my peers and my teacher as well, but um, it turns out that there are like these discussions and like Canvas messages and like um, what was it again? It's like blue, big blue button, yeah. and it's a face-to-face -face sort of like through the computer screen talking with your teacher and like a few other classmates that you have. How about the work that you had to do for the class? How is it different? maybe in terms of the schedule or? Well, um, there are these weekly due dates that you have to meet and um, these check your understanding quizzes that are like five questions each and they're for like, um, and you have one of them for each lesson. And they're, um, so what you do for each lesson is you just go and you take, you go through a PDF lesson on your own. There are like videos that you can watch mm -hmm. and then you take the check your understanding quiz and you just figure out if you understand it or not. Yeah, and it's a lot like more. You have to keep track of it, and you can go at your own pace. Laura, you're in the world of instructional technology, but your most important role that you play is Katie's mom. Yep. <laughs> so from a parent's perspective, what, what do you think about ELO and what Katie's doing in this online course? How do you feel about it? You know, I've been um, very excited for her. I think it's a great new experience for her. Um, I'd say one of the things I've noticed the most is that she's really come alive in this online environment. Um, Katie tends to be that student in the back of the classroom that just listens and takes it all in. Um, and in an online environment, she's just advocating for herself. She's speaking up. I also like the opportunity for her to be able to process a little bit more easily with the online environment because as she said, she is a visual learner and she kind of takes takes it in, looks at the discussion boards, takes some time, and then can reflect back on it. A little different than in the classroom on the spot. So some parents may have some hesitancy or some questions about having their child enroll in an online course. What advice would you give to parents who are considering having their children enroll in online courses? You know, I think it's important that you have a conversation with your child about what it would take to be successful in an online class. Um, I made sure in the beginning of the class to really stay in touch with Katie a little bit more than I would with her face-to-face -face classes. Um, that there's tutorials that they offered in the beginning to help us understand Canvas, the learning management system, and really how the class was going to go. And I did sit with her and went through the tutorials together. So I think that's important. Uh, I also think it's important to know when it's time to step back and really let that self-directed personalized learning happen. And it does. And it's been great to see. Great. So Katie, 
Your mom gave advice to parents. How about you? What advice would you give to other students about taking an, an ELO class, an online class? Well, I guess um, one of them would be like time management. You want to keep on track of all of your stuff that you have to be doing. Um, yeah, also like to be honest because um, you know those um, check your understanding quizzes I was talking about. Um, once you take them, like they give you the answers mm -hmm. so you can go and see what you got wrong. And even though you have the answers with you, you still have to go through and make sure you understand it because, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. So teachers have told us that they think the two keys to success for students enrolled in an online course is self-advocacy, caring for yourself, pushing for yourself as a student, and being self-directed. And you mentioned that, really knowing how to organize yourself, set your schedule, set your agenda. Um, do you feel those are keys to success for you? And if so, how do you apply those in your other classes as well? Yeah, I, I do agree with all of those. But um, I mean, in a normal classroom, I mean, like, you're much more dependent on your teacher. I feel like I'm, like, more dependent on myself and my um, online classroom, and I've been learning a lot of, like, life lessons, too. So. so do you feel that those skills that you've learned in the online class are transferring over into the traditional classes that you're taking? Yeah, definitely. Like, this year is going, like, much better than when I didn't have an online class last year in eighth grade. Okay. I, mean, I would second that. Talk more about that. Why would you second that? You know, it, interestingly enough, part of it's probably maturity too, but I just, it's been great to see her really paying attention to how she learns and what she needs to be successful instead of waiting for that teacher to say, here's the grade or, you know, you need to do this. It's been Katie saying, I need to do this. I need to change and work on something in a different way. And that's just been, it's, it, it's, it's a, you have to be able to do that in an online environment and she's done it. And it's been great. So you've advocated for yourself, and you've grown as a, a learner by being more self-directed. How about, just real quick, have you been able to develop any sort of relationships or friendships with students from other districts uh, through your course online? Yeah, I've met a lot of um, students from like 203, because I'm in 204. And I've been like talking to them through those um, big blue button conferences that we had. Yeah. and. Um, I've also had a chance to sort of help teach them. Like my um, teacher, one time in a conference that we were having, um, I got one of the questions right that the, um, this other student got wrong, and then she got one of the questions right that I got wrong. And so my teacher used the, um, each of our answers as examples, and she sort of guided us to um, teach the other students. So I thought like, that was very smart, and I was also like talking to that student. And I think that you wouldn't really be able to do that in a normal classroom. So overall, you'd rate your experience in an ELO course this year as very positive? Mm-hmm. And you'd think so, too? Yes. I don't think she ever wants to take math in the <laughs> traditional class again. <laughs> and so can I ask, do you have plans on taking another online course? Yep. Definitely next year. Okay. Great. Dan and I would like to thank our guests for joining us on this episode of School Scene and providing a more detailed look at the Expanded Learning Opportunities Consortium known as ELO. For more information, visit eloconsortium.org. Until next time, I'm Karen Sullivan. Thanks for watching.